my name is Ryan and I really appreciate you stopping by. What we're going to do in this video is walk through my process of how I built these two end grain cutting boards, both rather large, both around 16 inch by 20 inch. Built them both out of oak and walnut. The oak is actually repurposed oak and it came from my stash of old barrels slash barrel parts in the back there. Walnut came from the walnut store and I've got so much to show you, we're gonna get right into it. Now, this isn't the first time I've worked with barrel wood and it uh, definitely is not gonna be the last. Every time I decide to build something with a bunch of staves, I think to myself that I should really look into building some sort of steam box to straighten out the oak. But then I tell myself, it's only a handful this time, so I will just grind through the milling process and figure that out on the next go around. Well, here we are on the next go around and I still haven't figured that out. One quick note before we fully dive in here, you may see some things over this next little while that appear rather unorthodox. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say this video is for entertainment purposes only. Alright, the first thing to do is to take the curve out of each stave, and I do this by laying it flat on the miter saw, aligning the blade to where the wood starts to curve up, slicing it there, and then flipping it around and doing the same. I end up cutting about 4 inches out of the midsection of each one, and I just cruise through doing this to all the staves. In case you're curious, all the barrels and parts of barrels in my possession have come to me from my local distillery. Once Shelter Point decommissions their barrels and no longer has use for them, they make their way on over to my shop, where I have the best of intentions to one day break them down, and repurpose the oak into some really cool projects. The next step is to flatten one side of each board. I do this by running each piece through the jointer and can usually get a flat enough surface in three to four passes. Doing this gives me a face that I can ride along the planer bed in the next step. When I'm doing a repetitive job like this, it's a lot more fun for me if I know when it's going to end. So I figure if I have 130 boards and each one takes 20 seconds to process, that's 2600 seconds. Divide that by 60 seconds in a minute. I know it's going to take about 43 minutes to do 520 passes over the knives. Not that I'm counting every single pass, nor do I have a clock hanging in the shop that I can watch, but attaching numbers to things just helps me feel a little bit more in control. That, and I'm always trying to think one step ahead. Like a carpenter that makes stairs. The last few times I've worked with barrel wood, I only put a flat face on one side of each board and then went on to feed the other face through the planer. And since that face was anything but flat, it always took a few awkward passes to shave down the corners before the rollers really started to grab the material. What I did this time before heading over to the planer was joint the other side of each board, hoping that this would make life easier. The idea is to get everything milled down to the same thickness, but as you can see, I've got a variety of thicknesses going on here. So what I did was separate things into two piles. One pile consisted of the slightly thicker than the other and the other pile slightly thinner than the others. That doesn't make sense. The slightly thicker pile was the first to go through the planer and I sent it through as many times as needed to get it down to the same thickness as the thinner pile. The first half of the process takes some patience and overall just feels kind of clunky. I started with what looked like the thickest stave and fed everything through the planer at that height, then dropped the planer down and fed everything through again. Sometimes the rollers grab the staves and sometimes some of the staves are still too thin and just need to be pushed all the way through without any material actually being taken off. You just kind of work through the process until everything gets down to the same thickness and the material material is consistently feeding through. The next thing I do is trim up both edges at the table saw. First I run one side of each board through the blade. I adjust the fence for each board to take off the least amount possible while also creating a square edge. I could have went back to the jointer to do this but doing it here is faster and gives me a cleaner finish than the jointer would. Some of these staves are wide enough that I'll be able to get two usable pieces out of each one and as you've noticed by now I just kind of feed everything through and pick everything up once at the end instead of repeatedly shutting off the saw, walking around and stacking things as I go. Once one edge on each board is trimmed I set the fence just once and run everything through again. Each board ends up being two inches which means the full width bricks in the pattern will be two inches and the half bricks that create the staggered look will be one inch. I'm aiming to create panels that are 24 inches wide so I did a rough count of how many boards I had, how many panels at two feet long I can create with them and then I cut that amount plus a few extra at one inch wide. Technically these boards are ready for glue up and I could jump straight into making the walnut mortar strips but I decided to take things back to the miter saw and trim off the tails on each one. My reason for doing this is to eliminate any room for error during the first glue up. I really wouldn't put it past myself to somehow end up with the board flipped around in a panel where it shouldn't be. Honestly it seems like a really silly mistake that nobody could make but trust me sillier things have happened in this shop. With the tails trimmed off I can flip the boards end for end with no repercussions and for the few minutes this takes it's totally worth it to me. On to the walnut. 
that I've been pushing around this entire time. I need two sets of mortar strips. One set is going to be the thin edge grain rips that go in between the boards I just finished milling, and the other set will be the long end grain strips that come into play a little later on during the final glue up. The thickness of the edge grain rips needs to be the same as the thickness of the end grain strips. I find the best way to ensure the thickness of everything is consistent is to make both sets of strips at the same time versus slicing up the first set now and then trying to recreate the same dimensions with the end grain rips later on. I'm actually going to make the end grain strips first, which is what these four longer boards are for. The cutoff from each one will then be used to make the edge grain strips. Once everything's chopped up at the miter saw, I swing by the jointer to address one edge on each board. I'm not shooting for a perfect 90 degree edge here, I'm simply looking to create a flat edge that'll help me do what I want to do at the table saw, which we'll get to in just a minute. Next I swing by the planer to skip plane each piece. Scribbling some pencil lines on the boards and then running them through the machine until they're gone tells me when the surface has been planed enough. By the way, you'll notice this planer looks a little different than the one I was using before. That's because the one I was using before actually broke down during another project involving some pallet wood that I was working on at the same time as this one. If you'd like to see more about my planer episode and watch me unbox this one, check out this video. At the table saw, I run each board through twice. The first edge I put against the fence is the one I just ran through the jointer. I set the fence accordingly to take off as little as needed to true up the opposing edge, and I do this to all four boards, and then I put them all through again, except this time with the edge I just trimmed riding against the fence. This ensures I have a nice glue line edge on each side of the boards, and technically you should be able to do this with a jointer, but I just can't trust mine to get the job done like I need it to be done. You'll notice I'm not gluing the middle seam here, and that's because I'm creating two halves that'll fit through the planer before I join them into one large panel with only one seam that I will need to belt sand. All the other boards and clamps are to pinch everything as flat as possible while the glue does its thing. And since I failed to film the part where I plane the two halves down and glue them up again, we'll just jump straight to this part. I wish I could just run the belt sander back and forth over that seam until it's gone, but if I did, I'd have a low spot down the length of the panel, and once I go to cut this thing up into end grain strips, every single one would have a bit of a divot on the side of it, which would cause some serious gaps to appear in the final boards. What I have to do is run the sander over the entire surface. Essentially, I need to do the job that a drum or a wide edge sander would do, but with a 4 inch belt sander. I'm using 60 grit, and it's super important to only go back and forth like this. Going side to side can cause some seriously deep scratches to occur. Once that's done, I need to flush up the end of this panel before I can cross cut it into all the end grain strips. I don't have a track saw and I've never built a cross cut sled for my table saw so what I do is square up the edge and freehand it through the band saw following my pencil line. It's not a perfect cut but I don't need it to be. I'll have just one strip with some band saw marks on it that will get cleaned up later during flattening. I've never used the sliding table saw but I imagine it would really hit the spot right about now. I'm cutting these strips at 2 and 3 16 I want the finished boards to be exactly 2 inches thick and the additional 3 16 accounts for what the router will take off when we go to flatten the final boards. This got easier as the panel got shorter and once it was all cut up I pinched together and set aside four of the strips as these will be used to create the borders on one of the boards. Now for the part of the project that was honestly causing me a bit of anxiety simply because I didn't have a perfect way of doing it. I needed to rip each of these pieces into three strips. In the past I've cut these on the table saw but my table saw ain't what it used to be so I decided to try it with the band saw. My biggest concern was how I was going to clean up the blade marks afterwards but that was a problem for future me so I set the fence to 3 16 and just started running the pieces through and watching this from the angle I am now I should have put my other feather board on the back end of the saw to have a little more control on how the strips exited the blade. You can really see the tension in the wood release and a few of the pieces with voids simply broke apart. I kind of expected to have a few casualties so I had cut extra to start out with and as they broke I used some CA glue with an activator to bond them back together. Once everything was all cut up I got them quickly clamped together while I figured out how I was going to deal with the saw marks and cut the other set of strips, which were super easy. Since I hadn't adjusted the width on the bandsaw, I figured I'd run the rest of the walnut right through to create the strips I needed for the first glue up. And here's where I try something stupid. It's stupid because it can be dangerous, and it's extra stupid of me because I actually know better, but for some reason I decided to go against my better judgment. The first idea I had to remove the blade marks was to run everything through the planer, which is totally ill-advised because the strips are super thin and prone to breaking, and you're running them through the planer against the grain. Surprisingly, this actually went well for the first few, but then I was reminded why this is just never a good idea. So yeah, I went to plan B, which involved the Rotex. I used 100 grit paper in random orbital mode at about 60 
60% speed, and this worked very well. The only downside was that it was tedious, but just like jointing the staves, if I knew how long this was going to take, having that end in sight would make it a lot easier to push through. So I timed how long one piece took to sand, did the math, and worked out that this was going to take roughly two hours. So I settled in with a good podcast and just went into autopilot mode. Once the last of them were sanded, I put the end grain set back into the clamps and took the ones that I needed to the table saw to rip them down to the same thickness as the oak. And we arrive at the first of the three total glue-ups for these boards. You'll notice I'm doing that thing again where I leave one seam void of glue so that I can send the two halves of each panel through the planer before joining them into one and having just the one seam to hit with the belt sander. You know, a 24 inch planer is on my wish list right beside that sliding table saw. This part of the process is pretty straightforward. Lay out all the pieces, apply the glue, flip them over, apply more glue, clamp everything together, move to the ground, and repeat until finished or until out of clamps, whichever comes first. Luckily I had enough bar clamps to get through this, but I did have to rob a few of the smaller clamps and calls from the first ones to use on the last ones. After letting those sit overnight, I strip everything the following day. To keep track of which panels go together, I label the end grains so that even after they go through the planer, I can still tell which ones go with which. Because you better believe that no matter how hard I try not to, I'm going to end up mixing things up. When Whenever possible, I strip the clamps an hour or two after glue up to remove the dried excess glue, but since I glued these up at the end of the day, I didn't get to doing that, and 12 hours later, it's pretty dried on, not a lot comes off, but I gave them a go over anyways. Back at the planer, I take very light passes. I need all of these panels to end up the exact same thickness, and I want to remove as little material as possible. As they are already 9 16 of an inch thick, I really don't want to go any thinner than I absolutely have to. I fed them through multiple times, lowering the knives just enough to take off a nearly microscopic amount each time. I was hoping to take off no more than an eighth of an inch total on each one, but by the time I had everything down to the same size, these panels were pretty much bang on three eighths of an inch thick. Back to the glue up corner to join each of the two halves into the final panels, and the process is pretty much identical to the previous one. Put the pieces on the pipe, apply the glue, put the clamps on, change the camera angle, move it to the floor, next one, apply the glue, put it on the floor, next one, apply clamps, apply the glue, floor, put pieces on the pipe, put clamps on, apply glue, on the floor, drop it to the floor, Put that glue up on the floor. One more time and the last time. All right, that's not the correct order, but I just thought I'd mix things up there just for fun. Are you having fun? I'm having fun. Speaking of fun, here's a fun fact. I'm coming up on my one year anniversary of having put out my first video on YouTube. Honestly, I feel like I'm just getting started. The groundwork is complete. The foundation has been poured. It's time to build some walls. Every time you watch one of these videos, it helps me buy a few more sticks of lumber. And I can only assume that if you're still here, you're enjoying the show. And I assure you, I have many more episodes coming up. If you've already subscribed, I appreciate you and if you haven't yet I still appreciate you but if you could go ahead and get yourself subscribed that would be great just hover over their little symbol in the bottom right hand corner and click subscribe you can even do it without missing a single second of this incredibly thrilling glue scraping scene okay we're starting to get to the really fun stuff it won't be long now before we're slicing these panels into strips and assembling the brick patterns first things first though some more belt sanding is in order same method that I used on the walnut going across the entire surface with the belt sander ensures a consistent sand and minimal chance for nasty gaps showing up later once again I'm using 60 grit to do this and it makes super quick work of things it's like Borderline too aggressive, but I find 80 grit takes a little longer than I would like, so I live on the edge with 60. Last step before running everything through the table saw is flushing up an end on each panel to ride against the fence, and I'm going to go ahead and do this, you guessed it, on the bandsaw. Same idea as before. As long as I stay on my pencil line, I'll end up with a straight enough edge to ride against the table saw fence, and the bandsaw marks that are left on the first strip out of each panel will be dealt with during flattening. I should mention, and you might notice that I do get some chip out on these cuts, which can get in the way when it comes time to glue up. I usually run some sandpaper along the side of the cut edge to get rid of any of the chip out, but I didn't film that part because sanding is boring. Now we're getting somewhere. With the fence set at 2 and 3 16 I start slicing the strips. This time I'm a little more careful. I don't just push them all through and let them fall off the end of the table. Chances are they would break and I like to keep the strips from each panel together. A good idea and one you don't see me doing here is to use a zero clearance throat plate in your table saw for making cross cuts like this. It eliminates the gaps on either side of the blade and the chance for chip out on your material, overall making for some much nicer cuts and glue lines. I actually have one but I left it out because I'm having issues with this saw, specifically some blade wobble. I think I've got some arbor issues. When I have the zero clearance plate in, the blade doesn't spin as freely as it should and I end up having to force the material through which really isn't a safe thing to do and it usually just leaves some nasty burn marks. Honestly I've rolled this saw really hard for the last five years and I'm surprised it's not in worse shape. Working with reclaimed wood has its challenges. I was worried that I'd have a few strips where the 
holes you see in the wood here were going to end up in the surfaces of the boards. Luckily I avoided that problem like 99.9%. .9%. The majority of them are going to end up filled with glue and sealed away forever, never to be seen again. I did have a handful of strips that I had to pull off the playing field due to what you see here, and I just added them to my collection of leftovers and cutoffs, which I actually just combined all these into one giant funky looking chopping block. Make sure to check out this little short video if you want to see how that came together. You still with me? Awesome. I'm going to run one more thing by you. YouTube has a new feature called Super Thanks, which is really straightforward. What Super Thanks is, is a way for you to support what I'm doing here using your wallet. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're watching me build this table and you're like, you know, this guy seems all right. He's got a decent work ethic. I think I'd like to flip him a few bucks and help him out. To do so, you quickly come out of the video, click right here and choose the amount that you would like to contribute. Now for me, I know this guy personally and that he has a nine month old baby at home that is just cruising through the diapers. So I'm actually going to go ahead and send them five bucks. You put in your payment info and as soon as it's sent you get a fun little animation and you also get to leave a distinct colorful comment on that video. Now everyone else that watches that video can see your support and in this particular case everyone can see that I sent myself my own money and thanked myself for doing so. So that's fun. Before heading over to the glue corner, I flip every other strip around to create the brick pattern, grab the four pieces of walnut I set aside earlier, and head over to slop on the final glue. By the way, here is what a few days in the clamps did to all those end grain strips. I've been asked more than a few times now if I have plans available for my glue up jig, and the short answer is I don't. I put this jig together when I first got into this shop out of an old kitchen table, a bunch of 2x4s, couple 2x6s, and some PVC pipe I had kicking around. It's so completely rudimentary and hokey looking that I'm almost embarrassed to let it be seen but it serves the purpose really well and I'm sincerely flattered every time someone wants to copy and build one for themselves and perhaps one day I'll design and build a more professional looking version that I will have plans available for. When it comes to gluing one or both sides I am definitely in the camp of gluing both faces of the joint. I've been told more than a few times that I use way too much glue and while I certainly have some excess squeeze out I have my reasons. The first is that I do believe a glue joint is stronger when glue is applied to both faces. The glue seeps in the wood fibers equally on each side of the joint and forms the strongest bond across the joint. The other reason I'm liberal on the glue is because my milling isn't always perfect and especially here where I'm working with repurposed oak. I'd rather have extra glue squeeze out and find its way into any little gaps than to apply just the bare minimum and come back the next day to see little voids in my work. Speaking of gaps, here's a good lesson of what not to do during a glue up. Notice how I'm staring at something here? If we zoom in, you'll notice I've got a bit of a gap going on and just like that time I put those thin strips of walnut through the planer, I go ahead and do something I know I shouldn't do, and I move the clamp off the board, which is currently applying equal pressure across the glue up, and I put the clamp onto the strips themselves. As soon as you do this, you put localized pressure on that area and cause the strips to bend, and you can do some aesthetic damage to the board. Pay close attention later on, and your eyes will pick up on the slight bend that this causes to the overall pattern. Between doing that and my bad habit of over-tightening clamps, I've definitely got some room for improvement when it comes to producing perfectly straight-looking mortar lines. After sitting in the clamps for a couple hours, I do my usual scraping of the excess and it never ceases to amaze me how fascinating some folks find this. I've put a number of glue scraping clips up on my Instagram and the combined views between them all is in the millions. I guess I'm not the only one that finds this fun and satisfying. Once they're cleaned up, they go back into the clamps until the next day, at which point I take them out and let them sit for a couple days before flattening. This allows for any residual moisture from the glue to escape and any wood movement that's going to happen along with that to happen. Essentially, I'm just kind of letting them breathe and relax. Just like my glue up table, my flattening jig is another work of art, a real masterpiece, but it gets the job done. It's another one of those things that I keep telling myself I really need to make a better version of, but until it stops getting the job done, it likely won't be moving to the top of my priority list. I use a dab of hot glue in each of the corners to secure the board to the bench. Sometimes I'll put shims under the corners where needed, but in this case the board is already so close to flat that they're not necessary. The technical name for the bit I use here is a double flute straight bit, and I set its depth to the lowest of the four corners and begin by taking slow and steady passes. Routering end grain requires some patience. You go too fast and you'll get some nasty tear out. You go too slow and you'll get some burn marks. I only remove material on the forward pass as the bit is rotating in the direction of the grain. I don't take material off as I pull the router back. I tried that once and I had the router jump on me and gouge the board I was working on and to be honest it kind of scared the crap out of me. I aim to take off no more than an eighth of an inch material at once. If I have to go over the board a couple times to knock it down to a flat 
flat surface, then that's just the way it is. I'm not worried about the tear out at the edges is that will get taken care of in just a minute. Another thing I do after the initial flattening is done is drop the router bit down about a 32nd of an inch and go over the whole surface again. I find this cleans things up quite a bit and cuts down on the amount of sanding required. Speaking of which, that's exactly what I do after flattening. Using 60 grit again in the belt sander, I go over each surface of each board until I don't see any scarring left behind from the router bit. I find 60 grit is the magic number for this. I've tried going lower down to 50 and even 40 but found it left behind some significant scratches that just took forever to sand out with the orbital. I've also gone the other direction to 80 grit and once again it just wasn't fast enough for me. Before I square up the short edges at the table saw I'm going to run the long edges through the jointer. As I'm once again feeding the wood into the knives against the grain I take very very light passes and just enough to flatten the edge. The reason I do this instead of running the board through the table saw to true up the edge is because I find boards to be rarely dead on perfectly square. If I run this through the table saw to create a true 90 degree corner, chances are it's going to leave me with a long tapered cut that's going to be a lot more obvious than a board being out of square by an eighth or even a quarter inch. You'll have to forgive me as I apparently had my iPhone set up the wrong way to capture this moment. Once I had the long edges trued up, I was able to use my Incra miter gauge to square up the short edges. And no, your eyes do not deceive you. I am indeed standing behind my saw and pulling the board into the blade. Having this particular miter gauge on the back end of the saw gives it more support and allows wider material to be fed through the blade before the gauge leaves the miter track and starts basically flapping in the wind. I was hesitant to try this method at first but found it actually works really well. We are on the home stretch now. Before I carve in the juice grooves and finger holds I hit the surfaces of the boards with 60 grit in Rotex mode on full blast beast mode and then switch it to random orbital mode to do all the edges. This stage of sanding takes care of any marks left behind by any of the machines and ensures that the rails for my juice groove jig will sit as tightly against the board as possible. By now I've done probably over a hundred juice grooves but I still get a little anxiety when it comes time to do them. I've had a couple go sideways in the past and it's just an absolutely awful feeling when that happens. But these ones went well and I typically do my grooves in four passes. The first is a very light pass, the second and third are deeper and remove the bulk of the material and the fourth is just a quick cleanup pass. The key to avoiding burn marks is a sharp bit. Don't start in the corner, keep the router moving and get around those corners as fluidly and quickly as possible. The last thing to do before we get to all the sanding is to carve in the finger holds which I do with this incredibly simple jig I made out of a piece of plywood. Same as the grooves I take a few passes to do this. I actually move the router in the technically wrong direction to make this happen. As per the bits rotation I should go left to right but to avoid chip out I move it from right to left. It feels awkward and you really need to hang onto the machine but it eliminates the chances of tear out and leaves a really nice edge. So I'm sorry I lied to you that wasn't the last thing we needed to do. There's one more thing we need to do and that's to take care of any voids with some CA glue. I love this stuff and I use it all the time. It is such a problem solver. Although you do want to be careful using it on end grain as it can soak into the fibers around the void and leave you with some fun little marks that are tricky to sand out. I regret not making the handles a little wider on this board so that I wouldn't have this little blemish here. The glue ensures that structurally it won't ever be a problem and yeah it's just a feature of the board now. For sanding end grain, my process goes like this. I raise the grain with water, not a lot, just enough to moisten the surface. That causes the wood fibers to stand up. Once dry, I scribble a pencil line on and then I proceed to sand it off. Once the pencil line is fully gone, I know it's time to move on to the next grit. I do this in between every grit and I go through 80, 100, 120, 150, 180, 220, 320, and finally 400. I go Rotex mode up to 180. At 180, I pause and do all my hand sanding. I put the grooves and finger holds through the exact same grit progression. I I get asked all the time if I have any tips for sanding end grain and what I feel like I'm being asked is how can I make it go faster because honestly sanding end grain is a brute especially hardwood like maple or this oak. If you're looking to speed things up a Rotex sander combined with some of this ceramic abrasive sandpaper speeds things up immensely. I recently got onto this sandpaper and it's absolutely blown my mind how much faster I'm able to sand. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to try out the same sample pack that changed my life. For the final three grits I switch the sander to orbital mode and polish the boards up to 400. As great as the Festool dust collection is, there's still some residual sawdust left and before I drop the oil on the boards I use compressed air to remove it. After a quick photo shoot of the finished boards pre-oil outside for Instagram purposes, the time has come.
For oil, I've been working through the remnants of this five gallon jug. I used to have a large plastic tote filled with oil that I dunked all my boards in, but I've since gone back to this method. I use a lint-free rag to spread it around and typically let it soak in for around 20 minutes. The walnut has a nice mixture of heartwood and sapwood, and after seeing it come to life, I can tell it's going to blend and age really well with the oak. Speaking of which, another question slash comment I get a lot is, I thought oak isn't good for cutting boards because bacteria can grow in its pores. And I'll be straight up with you, I think that theory is totally bunk. The idea seems logical at first that bacteria can make a home in the larger pores of oak and multiply, but from the research I've done, wood itself is an antimicrobial material with oak and pine having some of the highest antimicrobial properties. These are also end grain boards and the vertical orientation of the wood fibers naturally repel and push out anything that tries to make its way down. This is also white oak, which is a closed pore wood. Red oak is the one with large open pores and that would likely be the species to avoid. But even then, not because of bacteria, but simply because the pores are like little miniature straws. You can literally run water through the board, so it just might not be the most practical for food prep. I've also read something like 90% of bacteria doesn't survive after 10 minutes of being on the surface of wood, and the rest is easily taken care of with proper cleaning. I suppose if you were to horribly neglect the board that it would give germs a better chance of growing, but just don't do that. Lastly, on this point, you may remember the large block I built out of two barrels nearly six months ago. It's made entirely out of oak and has been getting used a couple times a day in my kitchen every since and there's zero signs of funky stuff growing on it so I'm of the opinion that white oak is an excellent wood to use for an end grain cutting board and I certainly plan to keep on using it. I give the boards a solid 24 hours to air out before sealing them up with a coat of beeswax. This particular wax is made on a small island that's close to the island that I live on and I really like it. I do the bottom of the boards first and I'm actually using a piece of an old bed sheet to massage it on. That's honestly what this company recommends most to use. Like the oil, I give it about 20 minutes before wiping off the excess and before I flip the boards over to do the tops, I install rubber feet on each corner and I use this little jig I made to ensure they're consistently set in from each of the four corners. I screw them in by hand. I figure the screws are small enough that I really don't think any pre-drilling is necessary. The very last thing I do is flip them over and wax the top. No board I've ever built has been perfect and I imagine any board I build after these will also fall short of being perfect. It's what makes each one truly unique. It's the beauty slash curse of working with wood. It's an infinite process of continual improvement of skills and through getting better at working and creating things with your hands, I believe you become a little bit better at being a human being. Lessons learned in the shop can be applied generally across life. With every project, I gain a little more humility, build a little more confidence, develop a little more patience, and invoke a bit more appreciation for the materials given to us by nature, or in my case, my local distillery. More and more, I find myself working with reclaimed wood, and there's an added joy in being able to take some wood that started its life as a tree, was then made into an object that served a purpose for many years. Once that purpose has been exhausted, to be made into something else that will serve another purpose for a very long time to come. With the proper care and attention, these boards will last for many, many years and even have the potential to become heirlooms that are passed down to the next generation. All right, my friend, that is it for this build. Thanks again for your time and for following along all the way to the end. I've got some fun things in the works. Just as I was putting this video together, I came into possession of a couple hundred square feet of white oak hardwood flooring that I am definitely going to repurpose into a variety of boards similar to these ones. And in case you're curious about what that pallet board project was all about, here's a glimpse of what that turned into. I'm currently working on that video, so stay tuned for that. For now, I wish you peace and happiness, and until next time, take care of yourself and the ones around you. Bye for now.